Hello, and welcome to my channel. My name is Jonathan Cohn, and today I'll be re providing my review of the Star Trek Deep Space Nine Avatar series, book one and book two. No, I'm not omitting the titles of the books. That's literally what they're called, book one and book two. It's like thing one and thing two, but bookwise. The reason I'm including both of these together is A, because they're so short. The book one's only about 280 pages, Book two's only about 230 pages, so they really are quick reads. For, for my B reason, these two books uh, are really interconnected. It's really one big story that was just cut in half and uh, told into two different parts. And, you know, there is part one feels like a part one, and part two feels like a part two, but they really could have just been one big book. And so my third reason is... They aren't, aren't titles, and it's really hard to title to discuss about them without having the other one in the video. So I'm talking about part one, book one, and book two. So I'll begin by saying that this is a series that has a lot of history for Star Trek. Um, uh, after you have uh, Next Generation, they had big movies that continued the story. So the books didn't really tell an interconnected story. But once DS9 ended... There was no expectation that the DS9 characters would be in any movies. And so DS9 largely was open for taking. And the, the editors at Pocket Books, Simon Schuster, particularly Marco Palmieri, um, who I, as I read more about him, I'm just more impressed. He, he really is responsible for, the, for a lot of the great things that happen in Star Trek. Marco Palmieri came up with the idea of continuing on, essentially making season eight as a book series. And so he uh, came up with the idea for books one and two, which were both written by S.D. Perry, um, uh, the daughter of Stephen Perry, um, who's a fantastic, uh, or is it Steve Perry? No, Steve, the author, the author, Steve Perry. That's it. Um, she's Stefani Perry, which is not confusing at all, um, which is probably why she went by S.D. Perry. Um, uh, the This book, these books really follow up as a season eight. They pick up pretty much right where uh, the the Deep Space Nine finale leaves off. And as someone who has not watched too much of Deep Space Nine, it's my least favorite of the the that era of, you know, the, the next generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager. I say DS9 is my least favorite of the three, but I still enjoy it. And I've read some books recently, particularly the book Revenant by uh, Alex White, which I thought was an amazing read. So deep, such a deep book. Um, so I have enjoyed some of the books, and of course some of my favorite books have featured characters from Deep Space Nine that I really enjoyed, and so I was already familiar with everything that was happening in these books, but it was such a fun experience getting to read these books. Um, the way that S.D. Perry begins the story by making, uh, by basically establishing where all the characters are, and she telegraphs early on where they're going to try to go. You have someone like Kira, who has a crisis of faith in this duology. You also have someone like Ro Laren, who f has a crisis of conscience of what is she supposed to be doing with her life? You have Quark, who starts to fall in love with Laren, which is hilarious. Oh, that was a brilliant decision. That was hilarious. You also have someone like Nog, who feels like he's out of a little bit of out of place and feels like he could be doing more. You have someone like Ezri Dax, who starts feeling like maybe she should be on a command track instead of on a counselor's track. And if you've read any of the later books, you know what happens with her. And I was like, ooh, they're going to do that. They're going to do that. Oh, man, I loved seeing Ezri Dax take control in this book. And then you have the introduction of other characters as well. And so on that level, the book worked. books worked really well. You have promises in this book and payoffs in this book. However, there was some issues. As you can tell by the cover art, Jean-Luc Picard and all of the the Enterprise E crew from the Next Generation show up in this book. Uh, they're about in about a third of the first book, and they're very briefly involved in the second book. And while I love John Luke Picard, I think he's a great captain, and uh, I love reading about the Next Generation crew. They felt out of place in this book. They're really here for two reasons: one, to 
tell about the finding the orb because they needed someone not from DS9 for that, and also for marketing to be able to put John Luke on the cover to be able to tell a bigger story with more characters. That's essentially a crossover. But this is not a crossover book series or pitched as one. It is a DS9 series, so it should have had more DS9 focus. But it's still an enjoyable book, and it still has lots of DS9 focus. Um, I I would say that the new character introduced Elias Vaughn. He's very important later. He's basically space Sean Connery. I enjoyed him quite a bit, uh, even though his character is supposed to be 100 and still going strong. Um, uh I also really liked uh, the way that this book uh, series used the Gem Hadar and the Dominion and the Founders and all that stuff. Um, this book promises something big with Jake Sisko, and then he kind of basically disappears for most of the book, and he, he doesn't even finish his whole plot line. His plot line's kind of left out in the open, and I was very disappointed in that, so that dragged down my overall feelings. I also felt that part one had epic action scenes, had epic promises, had epic moments that made me feel like, yeah, we're in the season premiere. Season, book two paid off everything, but did the bare minimum. I would compare this to the way that you have the Book of Boba Fett for Star Wars paid off the, the series, but at the absolute minimum of what was required. Like, they had to include a Rancor. It was obvious you'd do that. But that's that's about what they did. You have Grogu using the Force. That's obviously got to happen. Things like that happen in this book series, but it's like the most obvious possible thing happen. And so it was kind of kind of frustrating that that how low the bar was set. But they still it's still a good book series in that she does pay off the promises. So it works in that sense. Um, the final thing I'll say about the books is that there's some great humor and some great dialogue that really makes it feel like a DS9 story. And really, I think S.D. Perry does get DS9 really well, which is why she's written so many. I think she's written like eight Star Trek books and like six or seven of them are for DS9. That's that's the reason why. So I highly enjoyed this series. I, I gave book one a four out of five and book two, a three out of five. So to put them together as a book series, a duology, I think it's a good solid 3.5 out of five for the duology. Good, but not amazing. But there's a reason that this book series has a place in history because of the importance that it brought to bringing an interconnected universe. And it brought 20 years of an interconnected storyline, which I really enjoyed. So that's my thoughts on this book duology. If you've read the Deep Space Nine Avatar books, what are your thoughts on them? Leave your comments down below. If you've read other DS9 books, uh, let me know which ones you recommend and don't recommend. I love, would love to hear your thoughts and find out what ones I should steer clear of or which ones I should head, go head on for. So let me know in the comments section down below what you think and uh, Please subscribe to the channel. I have lots of other Star Trek discussions and book reviews and whatnot uh, and other Star Trek related videos. And until next time, I'm Jonathan and thank you for watching.